Hello and welcome back to the Let's Get Wicked podcast. I'm your host, Joker Jonesy here, and this is the show where we talk about nothing but the game villainous by Ravensburger. I am joined by two lovely folks with me today. First, we have my lovely co-host, Headmaster Ditto. Ditto, it's been a while, not really a while since we've recorded the show. Um, how you been doing? Been doing okay. I can't really complain. Nice. You have coffee with you right now? Not, but I'm going to go make it until done, probably. Ah, I gotcha. I, uh, I've been trying, I'm trying to do this caffeinated tea thing to, uh, try to cu- cut my soda a little bit. So I feel like I'm drinking coffee, but at the end of the day, it's really yeah, not. Yeah, that's coffee. fair. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to do. Um, not only do we have Ditto, we also have one of my, one of my favorite people to have on the show, uh, Stuntman, the man that does his own stunts. Welcome back. Oh, that means so much more, so much to me. <laughs> Be careful with that ego there. <laughs> Now let's. Uh, I'm the one that's supposed to watch my ego. I'm the egotistical jerk. Let's just be real here. Um, welcome, Stump Man. How are you doing today? Man, I'm doing great. You doing great? You ready to talk some villainous today? I know you're always excited. Ready to talk some villainous? And I got me a cream soda, Dr Pepper here. So I'm ready. Oh, to those go. things are divine. Oh my those god, those are so good. I uh, I went to the store yesterday because uh well i'll do a little tangent about this on this show but i just moved into my new place today um or technically yesterday and i went to the store and i was going to grab myself dr pepper no dr pepper at all of any kind not even like generic store brand i was so depressed i was so depressed no because i ended up getting what was it uh you guys tried that new like classic pepsi thing where they do like the the real sugar you guys I haven't try seen that? that, but I'm very curious. I've tried it with that. Pepsi, but I've done it with like the uh, the old school like Mountain Dews, the yeah, throwbacks or whatever fantastic. they're called. Those are. Fantastic. I do want to try it with Pepsi because uh, I actually don't mind Pepsi that much. I know no, that's probably great. sacrilegious, but. All right. Well. Okay. All right. I got an honest truth. Coke or Pepsi here? What Tyler is it? Or- Pepper. Yeah, Dr. Pepper, if it's there. <laughs> I agree with that statement. Uh, generally, generally Coke, um, as far oh, as really? the actual drinks go. Yeah, for sure. Um, I do like Mountain Dew, though, so I, that's a score for Pepsi. No. I, uh, what, to me, how it goes is that when it comes between Coke and Pepsi, you got normal Pepsi overrules Coke. However, if I absolutely have to drink diet soda, and I do not like drinking diet soda, mind you, I have to go with Diet Coke because there is like Diet Coke is already disgusting, but you may as well just, be drinking. I don't know. It doesn't sewer have any water. flavor. It doesn't. It's just nasty. Like at that point, I would legitimately <laughs> rather be drinking LaCroix. Because <laughs> at least that has some semblance of flavor to it. <laughs> oh, that, that, that's a topic for another show. Um, that was a great <laughs> tangent that we'll probably end up bringing back up at some point during the show because it's it's probably more likely going to happen. But uh, today we have a very interesting topic that we are bringing to the show. Um, today we are talking about the Let's Get Wicked tournament, and what this is um, is that in our Discord, you fo- most of you folks probably already know this that are listening to the show, but for those of you who aren't part of the Discord or just aren't super into it, uh, we are hosting, or myself, and I'm, granted with a lot of you helping me too, so I can't take all the credit, but uh, we, are, we are hosting a Disney Villainous Tournament at the end of June that is going to be bonkers, and I cannot wait. Um, I, myself, am putting away some of my own money as prize money that the winner... Because we have a, believe it or not, when I put up the registration for this thing, I actually had to increase the registration size because it filled up in a matter of like 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Yeah, it, it was quick. I mean, it was, it was. I know we've kind of been dangling the insane, idea. And I was traveling and didn't get to register the first time. So I almost <laughs> missed out. No, Whoops. I, uh. I was I honestly because I knew I actually opened reopened the registration for Stuntman and there was another our friend uh, Great Salmon also didn't reach the registration in time. I knew Salmon really wanted to jump in on it, so I had to make sure. Uh, I was like, I have to, I have to, I have to add more. But uh, I know that was it. Ditto, you were saying about the 
because we were trying to, I was trying to do a tournament for a while. Yeah, uh, the the first time you tried to do this, you got what, maybe three people yeah. who wanted to actually play. Yeah, three. But that was before the podcast. That was like back in. It was like what, December, October, right? November. Yeah, it was November, December, something like that. Around that time, and. What was it? And it, it's amazing how much time passes where we went from being able to not even get eight people to sign up to the point that I had to increase registration for this freaking thing. Well, I mean, what's more amazing is that it wasn't really that much time at all. No, You're I can get five months max. Yeah, it was it was a short time. And I think after I extended the, the registration and it only took an extra day for it to fill up. So. Um, but yeah, we are having a 24 person, um, tournament of Disney villainous. And, uh, we're going to talk about the tournament today because as our friend, as I, we, this is why we have stuntman with us. Stuntman is actually going to be participating in this tournament and has actually helped myself a little bit in terms of actually setting up the tournament and just having some thoughts as well as ditto. Ditto also had some input on this as well. Um, just because I, as we all know, the world is in a weird spot right now, and my my one of my most favorite events of the year, Evo, got uh, basically put online. And my dream, after since I've been playing Disney Villainous, is to essentially create the Disney Villainous Evo. So step aside, Smash Brothers. Step aside, Street Fighter. We're gonna see uh, we're gonna see Disney villains try to kill each other. Essentially, well, not kill each other, but you know. Um, that's what that's what this show is all going to be about. We're going to be diving into a little bit of the rules and kind of what we're, our our thoughts and feelings going into this are. We're going to talk with Stuntman about how he's feeling going into this tournament and all that fun stuff. So I guess what I first want to start with is I want to talk about one of the cool things I decided to do, and I know you both can, kind of helped me with this, is uh, we have an achievement system, which is pretty dope. Yeah, yeah. Um- it, the idea behind that is that like you want it to have some credit for what you're able to do with the character beyond just whether you win or lose. Like if you manage to do something cool, we're gonna we're, we're gonna throw you a bone for it. Like yeah, um, the way that it's working right now is that uh, there is a list of achievements for every single character, and there is a general achievement where or how the achievements work is that each one has a point value associated with it, and um if you reach a certain point threshold uh you will actually get some bonus cash so there's a bronze tier silver tier gold tier etc cetera, etc cetera. and depending on how many points you get you will actually net yourself a few extra bucks and the nice thing about this too like ditto said is that i'm doing this mainly for those of you who know how to pilot a character really well and can do cool stuff with them you can gain some points, and even if you don't make it to the top three, which is where the cash prize money comes into play, you can still get a few extra dollars to kind of um, throw your way. So I know Stuntman here has told me that he's trying to figure out how to sw- if he's trying to if he wants to swag his way through this tournament. I know I'm really debating on like, do I want to go for the win or do I want to like achievement hunt? Because I've always been, especially ever since achievements have been a thing like i've loved achievements and i've loved achievement hunting and so you coming up with this system i'm like oh i could just go for the achievements and get you know as many achievements as i can on all the characters or you know just just try and actually win so i'm, I'm still debating I mean, on what, what i want to do with that why, why not both i mean you could you could do both that's true because what's true. really nice about how a lot of these achievements are actually designed so far is that uh, a decent number of them are all just based directly on, okay, you know, like, how are you pulling your goal off? Like, if you do a certain series of steps towards your goal, I mean, you can fill achievements that way really easily. Yeah, for sure. Is there any character, Stuntman, right now that you were looking at where you're like, do I just want to play this character just for the achievements? Is there any? Scar. Scar? Yeah. Oh, I mean, because yeah. oh, I, no. I don't know. I mean, Scar's, you know, he's 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 more difficult character to win with i mean but i, I think uh i think you, you scar would be, that he is a he can win he definitely can yeah. win but he, he takes takes patience it, it takes patience and it takes a little a little under a little more than understanding of the the core game to really kind of like make it strong if that makes sense yeah um, for sure yeah 
I, uh, I'm really, I, I like how you, cause, uh, a lot of these achievements of what I did was one day I literally sat down with every character and I'm like, I need to make a hard achievement to a medium achievement to an easy achievement. And I appreciate the fact that, um, with a little feedback from you folks and such that we have something that looks really cool. So I'm looking forward to seeing how these get accomplished throughout the games. And I initially was in the process of building a tournament, like, account system where you can actually have achievements tied to an account and you can actually brag about which ones you've gotten in a particular tournament um unfortunately when you're moving and you're trying to program something by yourself um not everything goes according to plan although it still looks pretty sick right now um and it's, it's just it's just not ready um but that's definitely something i want to do in the future because we will probably do this again where you folks who can participate will be able to show off the cool things that you were able to do. And yeah, it's okay. We'll just keep track of it all retroactively and add oh, it all yeah. up when it's ready. That's what sell spreadsheets are for, my friend. Exactly. For. No, don't use your PC for PC gaming. Use it for <laughs> doing your Excel spreadsheets, um, all that fun stuff. That's the, that's what PCs are made for. It's a, it's a running joke from another podcast I listened to that, Maybe maybe two people listening to the show I actually know about. Um, what is it? Are there any other achievements that stand out to you folks that are when you're taking a look at the list? Is there any cool? Uh, there is there there have been some. Um, I'm trying to remember what they are right now. I'd have to go back and look through them, so I'm not going to remember. But uh... there's one in particular, and there's actually two in particular that I want to see. Um, the first one is captain hook um his hard achievement is that you have to defeat peter pan by moving him all the way from hangman's tree to the jolly roger in one turn that's one i want to see i mean it shouldn't be that hard to do really it's a very specific setup and you know, i think it can only be accomplished with three specific cards right yeah, so you need to have the cannon and the the ingenious device at the hangman's tree. Then you need to be able to play Mr. Starkey to move Pan in some shape or form. And then make sure beforehand you have enough strength allies to defeat him no matter what his current uh, strength value is. Um, I have seen this done once in the flesh in my entire life it was incredible to see when it happened um my mouth dropped when it happened because it was just <laughs> it was bonkers um because it does require a bit of setup but is essentially a one turn guaranteed win and i've been playing against a lot of hook lately there is a well I'll, i won't say the name to spoil who he is but there is a hook player that's on our server that's really good with hook and i think people are sleeping on him as a character, but we'll, we'll get to the character stuff later in the show. I mean, I hate to dredge up the tier list stuff again, cause I know that just happened not too long ago, but, uh, uh yeah, well, Hook, Hook is really consistent. I, I don't see why everyone's sleeping on him. He's a, he's surprising. No, he's incredibly strong and I, I can't wait to see some cool hook stuff in the tournament. Uh, the other one I definitely want to see is, uh, and as someone who's been trying to learn Pete recently and bashing his face into a wall doing it, um i want to i want to see someone accomplish three goals in one turn because it's doable i want to see it happen that one that one's gonna be rough that one will be rough it's going to be very very tricky to set up but i think it's very doable oh it's very doable i forget what ditto what was one of the games that i was playing against you with pete you took care of two in one turn right yeah. that was and i had a third one lined up for the start of the next turn yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it's it didn't quite pan out because Pete, kind of like what we talked about before, is Pete's Pete's one of those. Uh, I think he's he's an engine builder. You know, you have a lot of setup, and then all of a sudden, it's like bam, 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 bam. I've got all my goals accomplished. I win. I'll tell you one thing though. When uh, Ditto and I recorded a mirror match of Pete, that's going to be going up to the channel at some point, point. Uh, and. When you're when you do not have win big as your goal, Pete is one of the most incredibly fun characters in this game. Mm 
Mm-hmm. But oh my god. See, I don't like that I'm, car. I'm the type that believes that Strike It Rich is still the stupidest one. Like, all the others are pretty easy to deal with, but I hate Strike It Rich. I well, hate Strike, Strike It Rich. I think, is the one that, in the Fate deck specifically, gets turned to the most, for the most part. Oh, it is. And that's yeah. part of the reason I hate it so much. No. I don't mind it that much, but it's 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 more of the fact that, like, it's there, there's so much process to trying to do win big, and... Especially like when uh, I was playing someone recently and my win big spot was on a space where you can get covered by a hero um, to play a card. And I was like, oh, no, don't do this to me right now. Well, see, the thing about win big, though, is that you have to think about how many cards in Pete's deck are actually worth two power. Right. That's a lot. If you can try to get win big accomplished before you have to shuffle, like you have a pretty good chance of winning it. Oh, yeah, for sure. If you get that done... You have to get it before you shuffle, because yeah. at that point, you're already too far behind. Yeah. But uh, One big is probably the one that annoys me, personally, the most on Pete. Yeah! Join the boat with me. Um, Strike it rich. I mean, I, it's it's one of the more difficult ones, I'll say, just because it's so it's very obvious what you're doing, and so I feel like a lot of people... But when they see you moving those items, they're like, oh, okay, that's where, you know, he's doing that for to move those items there, so let's do something about it to fix it. Um, so I feel like it's one of the more difficult ones, but, man, win big, I just, I've, I mean, I've played a game, <laughs> I don't know, I think my record was like six times in one game. Yeah. And I was like, this is stupid. <laughs> yeah. I, th- I think that's the, I think so playing can't is the most off for last. That's game. the only thing. No joke. Ditto has witnessed me doing that once, where I literally but, the table with the uh, with the other one with uh, with Striker Rich. I mean, you know, you have so many cards that help you. You've got the parrot to dig stuff out of your discard pile. You got the horse that can just move an item wherever you want it to. You know, there's a, there's a lot of there's, there's a lot of way. tools to help you. Compared to all of the other that ones, so super good. So much time to set up. And it's so easy to just Horus or Pluto or Mini and poof, it's gone. There's your chance out the window. The thing, too, I've learned with Pete is that, like, he has options to move those items around and even the allies. But uh, Ditto and I have discussed this, I think. I forget if we talked about this on the podcast or not. But we we talked about how, like, when you play Horus or Parrot, you know, um, depending on where you put them and, like, how long they stay out, you only have so many horses and you're always going to get at least one of the ally goals. And Mm -hmm. if you aren't able to use those allies to vanquish something, then they're just going to stay out on the board board and you can't really do recycle. I don't think we talked about that on the podcast, but that's like one of the main hangups I still have with Pete is just that like, if you're not careful, you can end up being in this weird spot where all your allies are played and you really, really need those effects to help maneuver things. Right. And yeah. the most part, another reason why Strike It Rich is so stupid. <laughs> and the thing too is someone fading Pete for the like if they know that like they used all their utility cards, then why would they want to play a hero if they got a hero and effect that they can use? You know what I mean? Because they're like, why am I gonna put a hero out that they're gonna vanquish um with these allies that they want to get back on their deck in some shape or form? You know, and, right? Yeah. You know. Um. Wow. Or, 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 I love tangents in this show. Um, it's great. <laughs> I, see, I think, I think, I see both of you looking at the achievement thing. Is that you two? Yeah, I'm on there. Mostly. Oh, okay. Is there any other achievements before we go into the next talk? Is the P talk yeah. is actually a really good segue into something I want to talk about. Um, yeah. um, I think you need to have the uh, the the poison brewer be at least twenty poison. Just oh, should it's I? So I easy to brew poison. No, I'm just kidding. But, that. but it 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 is. Uh, oh, yeah, I've that seen I've cool. seen I've seen up to twenty twenty five poison pretty easy with Evil Queen. But I also have in my house that really loves to play Evil Queen. So oh, yeah, I, yeah, <laughs> you told me this. That's why you got your scar Evil Queen draining in. Yeah, Evil Queen is just a uh, real, real good. But as we all know, I can defeat an Evil Queen pretty, pretty good. Pretty good. It's now actually live on the channel. Um, the proof is finally there. I no longer have a match lost to a computer hard reboot. Um, 
All right. Let's segue into a topic that I want to jump into uh, with this. So one of the things for this tournament that I'm really curious about is that ever since we started doing the show and even a little bit beforehand, I think with a lot more people coming into the community, we've been able to crack a lot of characters and figure out like what their gimmicks are, what their really good plays are. And even as the, the game has evolved, like we talked about when we had Salmon on our show with the speculation where now there's the Jafar um, two deceptions or use deception manipulation into deception and use it again. Some crazy meta defining like stuff. Shenanigans. Crazy. Um, <laughs> Pete, Barella, and Gothel, I do not think have been cracked at all. Nope. I mean, there are some people that have managed to get some decent plays with Corella down, but that's yeah. a lot of situational stuff, probably. Yeah, I agree. Um, I don't know. Um, Pete, I, 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 I'm, I probably disagree on this one again, just because I feel like his so many of his goals are tied together. And like I said before, his cards, there's no room for a bad card in his deck. No. So I, I do feel like he, again, my wife, she plays Pete a lot. That's her second favorite character, I think, um, after Evil Queen. And so I've seen some pretty cool plays with Pete and see, seen what he can really do. It, it's true that he doesn't have a bad card in his deck, for sure. And in fact, if you took a lot of the cards in his deck out of context, they'd be like almost busted uh looking at you bandit but the problem is if you don't draw the right ones like it doesn't matter how many good cards you have if you draw them in the wrong order you're doomed yeah i agree if you draw all your bandits before you draw any of the uh play of games then yeah but that's that's I and mean, you can't really you can't really use that as an argument in my opinion because that you can apply that statement to every single villain something you can apply to every single villain doesn't can't use it as an argument against one of them. I think I think it's a difficult thing. I see both sides of it, where you got Pete, like his yeah. The, the one thing for sure is like the cards themselves. You draw them in the wrong order, you definitely can screw yourself over. I remember there was one one of the Pete games I played recently when I was playing him was I drew two parrots turn one, and parrots only one strength, and you wanted to use it to get a card back, but when all your cards are allies and items, I mean, when in the first two turns of the game, are you really going to be discarding any of those out of your hand? Or do you really want to? Um, but you've also you know, got cards like Sneaky there. Pete, where you can just put it, you can either put it back on top or put it on the bottom of your deck. And it, you know, that's why it's still there for later use. Yeah. But then it's like, did I draw Sneaky Pete turn one? Um, it's a, it's a, a rough time but then it's at the same time though like when you get the sneaky peats and you get the cards that you need in those turns you you're pretty consistent it's more of making sure that the cards get their full use because really every card in pete's deck is useful towards any one of the goals in some shape or form it's just a matter of how you actually manipulate using them because even sometimes discarding a bandit into your discard pile from your hand might actually not be a horrible idea because you're like, all right, I already got two out on the board. Um, I do. I really need to put another one out there right now because my goal might not need it, and I need to make sure like play a game is fulfilled, stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think there's I think there's a lot of arguments to see Pete be played well. I think one of my biggest issues, and this is also goes to why I don't think Yzma is strong as people think she is, but then again, I've also seen some insane stuff with her recently too, um, where the the randomness factor just makes it super inconsistent from a defense and an offense perspective where like wherever those goals get placed and what goals they are you 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 don't you you can have a game plan but just that on itself can really harm you being able to play the character effectively i guess is the best way to Oh yeah it. for sure yeah, and it, it that's what i'm so excited about um from a commentator like viewer perspective on this is to see some of these like I don't want to. I don't know. I don't know if that word "high level" is going to be right, but once you start getting into those final matches, seeing oh, yeah. these higher level plays and these, the, you know, the tech decisions that go into them, it's going to be really cool. And I think after this tournament, we're going to see a pretty big shift in the meta of how this game is played. I cannot wait because that is the one, and we'll talk more about this. But I cannot wait to see the the change in the game that like evolves from like the final rounds of the tournament 
just because you're going to see people do things they don't normally do because their their brains are going big brain attack full you know brain blast maneuvers going on right now oh yeah and for sure it's going to be insane um i agree ditto with the corella thing i feel like corella is probably the most cracked of the three characters um it's just because when she first dropped we kind of all looked at her and it was like what what is this what, what are we holding yeah. right now? right like i don't think uh it was just kind of like what you've been doing with scar and all them it's just like it's so it's incomprehensible that we had to try to figure it out somehow right because she is incredibly weird in the fact that she's only got two allies she has to use the allies to vanquish and you have to find ways to keep the heroes off the board because her realm is set up where the heroes themselves their effects can be brutal sometimes but just them covering up a space of with the move action or the activate action is really brutal against her game plan. And you have to figure out how to get them off the board. And she has tools to mitigate that, which funny enough, as we've talked about before, she's a better Ursula, um, a better designed Ursula overall um, in terms of fun factor and some game decisions. But um, I think I'm looking forward to see if anyone shows anything with Corella. Uh, I've been playing her a little bit too. Um, because just a, a side note for everybody, I've been trying to crack open the perfectly wretched characters more just to kind of see more of their gimmicks and such to see how they operate. And I was playing with Corella recently, and the whole thing of putting all the puppies out on the board first and then capturing them is so good. It is incredibly good. She is unstoppable at that point. It's insane. Yeah, when I first read that strategy, we implemented it here at the house, and I was just like, oh, this is, it's not only funner, but it's just, it's just better in general. Oh, no, because uh, the it, thing it I... It makes the most swingies what it does. Oh, yeah. Because you're uh, not wasting turns trying to, okay, find, capture, find, capture, find, capture. Right. Because uh, from a consistency perspective, if you're not worried about capturing right away, you could focus on putting cards out to or playing cards and doing activate abilities to just put puppies out on the board. And then all the fake cards that have to do with capturing quote unquote might've already been used. Their effect was like neutralized because you haven't captured any puppies or they already got, they couldn't be played at that moment. And I've been telling people the thing with Corella is that her fate deck is like 50, 50 consistent where like, it's about taking puppies off the board or halting your ability to put puppies out. Or it's based off of like trying to get puppies that are like stop your ability to capture or um, take puppies that were captured and put them back. And once you can get over one of those like pillars, you're home free because you're you're just set. There, there's nothing stopping you. I just there. She doesn't have like a cool like overarching play. The only thing I've seen really done is that someone was able to. I forget if I recorded this or if this was uh, something I did off recording, but uh, someone was able to get like four or five puppies at one location. And then in one turn, they literally used Jasper twice and nabbed like, I think it was like 66 puppies worth of stuff. It was insane. So um, that's a cool play. No, it was a really, really smart. And then on the nice thing too, they had it set up where they can capture the rest of the puppies they needed the next turn in some shape or form. It was insane. Um, it was brutal. And like, there was nothing you could do at that point to really stop it. Cause at that point it was like too late in the game to really kind of figure out what to do. Um, but yeah, Corellis, Corellis is going to be exciting to see, uh, Gothel. I don't know if we're going to see a lot of Gothel. Gothel makes me angry. Yeah. I don't, I, I, I really like playing her. She reminds me so much of why I like playing Hades, but I just don't think people have cracked her open yet to see what those big plays are. Like, the only thing she's got right now is the big trust swings. That's all she's got. I, w I wish she had something cooler. but Yeah, I think she's the one I've played the most from Perfectly Wretched. But, again, I mean, she's just... She, she's fun, but there's not... Like you said, there's really not a lot of those big plays. But it, it is satisfying when you do get, you know, one of those four or five turn trust swings. And it's like, oh, yeah, that just happened. Oh, yeah, no. It's a... Uh... It feels really good when it happens, but it requires so much stuff. And then that at that point, the opponents either halted your progress or they're about to win. And you're like, "Well, I just I spent four turns setting up a six uh, trust uh, play here, and well, that sucks." So, 
at that point, you're like, are you going to go swag? Are you, <laughs> you going to go out with swag? Or are you going to go <laughs> out with, yeah. Uh, you know? The main thing is, and this may just be because of a lack of experience on my part, but it seems like it's really hard with golf to really have efficient turns. Oh, yeah. To tr- Trying to set up properly with her is a lot more challenging than it looks, even though that's kind of her entire game. She's one of those characters that you really have to play two or three turns ahead. And, you know, you, keep, you have to, with her, I found keeping one card in your hand for three or four turns, whereas usually it's a bad idea for most villains, is not a bad idea with her because it allows you to to pull off those combos, those three four trust combos. Yeah, I, I've also been finding, when, when I've been playing her recently too, what I've been finding myself doing is that I will literally go to the Snuckly Duckling and gain the power, but really not play any cards. I, and I might get rid of some cards I know I'm not going to be using just because one of the things too is that you want to be able to play cards when you want to. And mm-hmm. I find myself where there are tons of cards that I get in my hand that I want to play and I could play but I'm so power starved because I've been playing so much and she doesn't really have a good power generation system in her deck or realm really um, that it makes it really hard to play cards. Like there've been so many times that I did the, I did the, the swing to set it up that the next turn I can play. Uh, I love you most and net two trust at the tower and then like fate and all that stuff, but mm-hmm. I have no power. So I can't play the card which sucks. Yeah, I found myself a lot of times jumping between the duckling and the forest just the first like you know, maybe 3 or 4 turns just do that, play play what you can, you know, right. but not really not really do any big power plays and don't even worry about Rapunzel. I mean, let her get all the way to Corona and deal with her later cuz you're not losing trust during no. those first couple turns of the game. There you have no trust to lose, so why worry about moving her back right now? Right. You know, build build your power up, build your engine and then at Corona at once, the entirety of playing Gothel. And I played a decent amount of Gothel. She has so many tools to, to prevent that. Oh, yeah. So many tools. It's just, it's just actually being able to gain the win condition currency to actually win the game consistently. Yeah. Is her, uh, is her thing. But, uh, yeah, I'm really, I'm really curious to see these three characters kind of shine in a tournament because I think... With the podcast starting and the community that we've grown with the with the show over the past few months, and people getting even more excited about Villainous when Perfectly Wretched was coming out, we were able to kind of like dissect a lot of the core cast. But like the the Perfectly Wretched characters are the ones I'm really looking forward to see in the tournament. I think I think the most we'll see, and this is not me trying to say anything about the who picked teams, and we'll actually talk about that here in a second, is. Um, I, I think we'll probably see the most Pete. I think Pete is probably really I have the most fun with, and as well as like you can figure out what to do with him very easily. That, that doesn't surprise me all that yeah. much. He does surprise me. I, I from from an outsider, I guess looking in, I expected to see Evil Queen on every single team. Speaking of teams, let's let's jump into that topic really fast. So one of the things with the rules of the tournament that I put into place was. Um, initially what I wanted to do was I wanted to make it so it was a normal, you know, like if you've done fighting game tournaments before, any character basically can go, um, even the ones that are the most busted characters. Um, but the problem with that, that I didn't want to do is that we all know, we've talked about this plenty of times on the show that evil queen is incredibly good. And if I did not put some type of limit on the characters that people could play, especially when money is on the line, you would be seeing nothing but Evil Queen and probably top-tier characters throughout the entirety of the tournament. Not to say that we can see interesting stuff, but you would be seeing the same stuff over and over and over again. And you can only see so many EQ mirrors or EQ facility games. like. Yeah, no, as... I I know I know I put Ditto through the ringer recently with doing a bunch of mirror matches. I think Ditto's done for a little while. Um, I'm perfectly fine with mirrors, just not the bad ones or uh, ones where the cards don't go in your favor, right? Either one of those. Yeah. Let me tell you, if if I had to see an Ursula mirror match in this tournament, I will cry. 
Um, but yeah, so the team system be the works. Here, right? uh, the the way that the team system works in this uh, tournament is that each player, when they signed up, had to choose three characters, three different characters. And they are allowed to change their team up until basically the day of the tournament. That team has to be locked into place. And throughout the tournament, you can choose between any of those three characters. However, there is a system in place to make sure that there is still some type of variety. Because in theory, you know, let's say as I am, you know, Stuntman and I are the, the scar, the scar boys of this server. And if I want to play scar throughout the entire tournament, you know, and someone was really scared of going up against a scar, they could ban my character. And that character, I can cannot be used for that particular match. And I have to choose another one of my two characters on my team. Now you only get two bans a tournament. And what that means is that you as the player can only choose to ban another player's character twice throughout the tournament. So I was doing the math and everything based off the amount of people we have. It's going to be, if, like an average, if someone is going from all the way from winners or and losers or whatnot, people will average around three to four games. So um, that's that's the, that's why I was like, two bands makes the most sense. So yeah, what teams do we expect to? What teams do we expect? Coming I up? expect to see a lot of Evil Queen, Maleficent, and Queen of Hearts is what I expect yeah. to see the most of. Queen of Hearts is going to be a big pocket character, I think. Really? Yeah, it, it comes back to something that I mentioned way back in the very first tier list video we did, which was like yeah. episode three or something. Yeah, it was episode where three. Where this game tends to favor characters with a lot of random elements. Interesting. Where you've got like the Queen of Hearts take the shot, Facilier with his fortune deck stuff, to an extent Pete with the realm stuff. Isma's got a couple random things, but just it, in general, I think this game favors really high randomness characters because they have the chance to swing a victory really fast. Do you think that has something to do with the fact that so like Queen of Hearts and Facilier, I think makes sense of that argument. I don't not 100% sure with Pete or Yzma, but I will explain my reasoning here in a second. Is that uh Facilier and Queen of Hearts, they both have very good tools to mitigate that randomness factor. So like with Queen of Hearts, you know, by the time you play take a shot, most of the cards that might be expensive are probably already discarded as long as you're playing the character smart. With Facilier, you can mit- you can get rid of cards in your fortune pile and make it so I actually did this uh, a week or two ago. I was playing Facilier, and all I had to do was play Cards Will Tell, and boop! I, I, the only card that was in my fortune pile was Real New Orleans, and I won the game. Yeah. I think it has a lot to do with the, you know, the either win at the start of your turn or the instant wins. Mm-hmm. But instant wins. like I mentioned oh. on, the, um, on the Fate Wars episode, there are certain villains that their fate decks are nowhere near as brutal as other ones. Um, right. And that, even though Maleficent has a pretty brutal fate deck, depending on the situation, she hard countered Evil Queen. That's why I think she'll be in there. Oh yeah. And then Queen of Hearts, I think, is she just doesn't have a very brutal fate deck, aside from the whole, you know, Alice being unable to move anything and getting locked out of winning at all. But other than that, I mean, it's really not that bad. No. Yeah, because the, the the only thing when I when I was messing around with a little bit of Queen of Hearts, and I know Ditto has played a lot of Queen of Hearts against my Scar, and to to his favor and fortune most of the time. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, which is amazing to see that counter matchup work in its favor. But it's amazing how that some fate decks really only rely on one card to be incredibly brutal. Cause in theory, you can even think about that with Ursula where Ursula's fate deck overall is not that bad until Ariel comes out. And then the entirety of the entire game just wants to go slap you in the face. So, well, And I don't want to necessarily out myself here. Cause as soon as I say this, uh, I will never win with queen of hearts again. Oh no. But- The biggest thing that I think the biggest mistake people make playing against Queen of Hearts is relying too much on just playing whatever. Like, if there's a hero, 
boom, play it, boom, play it. Oh. One of the biggest things in Queen of Hearts' uh, fate that, that makes it more brutal is being able to enlarge heroes. Having oh, a hero no. take three different actions is insanely brutal for the Queen of Hearts to deal with. Because all of the cards that she would really use to kind of mitigate that are expensive. Right. On top of everything else she's trying to pay for. But right. a lot of times, especially with you and Scar, I just see, it's a hero, bam, put him down, put him down, put him down. And by and large, I'm not going to say heroes are completely ignorable with Queen of Hearts, but they're not hard to get rid of. They're really no, not. I, I, I agree. I, I mean, think yeah. enlarging Alice or enlarging the Dodo or something, just to make the uh, one effect on that card also cover up an extra action is a little worse. I gotcha. But that's just me. Yeah, that's definitely that's definitely one of the better. Well, and that's another thing. Going back to Fade decks is the effects have to be super powerful in most of the decks because they're not permanent. Right. I um. Interesting. This is interesting. Interesting takes here. Um, I know of some things. I won't. I won't. I'm not I'm sitting here trying to reveal stuff. But uh, the teams that I've seen are going to be very interesting. Uh, I definitely see people using particular characters in particular ways, and are understanding what counter matchups are. Um, that's one of the things I'm really excited to see is the character, the players that are really going to rely heavily on these very strong characters, and then we have character people who are trying to be straight mains. Like, I know for a fact if I was participating in this tournament, I would run Scar into the ground until I know I could not win. I would run him until he is destroyed. But with, you know, the thing is, like what Ditto and I were talking about, like, it was very clear that Queen of Hearts against Scar is pretty brutal. And I think half of it has to do with the fact that Queen of Hearts is definitely faster, has that randomness oh. element. And... I, I don't know if faster is the word, but definitely more streamlined, we'll say. What do you, what do you, what, what do you mean it's by that? It's very hard as Queen of Hearts to end up in a situation where you can do actually nothing. That is true. You can always activate a card guard or play one or shrink something. or like There's always one thing you can do in a turn. Yeah. With Scar, if you don't have the right hand, it just kind of falls falls apart. Yeah, it um Yeah, this is a very very true statement. Um there is a there's been some interesting things because I've been playing a lot against uh Captain Hook because I honest I honestly think of all the characters and even with us like recording the matches and stuff, I think Captain Hook is the one that I played against the least in the entirety of this game, and I don't know necessarily why. I think it's just probably because I play against a lot of people who don't like playing Captain Hook, or they're just not super, like, into Peter Pan. But the one of the things I'm super looking forward to with some of the decisions is, like, with Captain Hook, he has the best mitigation of his fate deck of all the characters. To the point where he can mind game you into not fate, or trying to fate him, or not fate you. Because I've literally seen it where they play Give Him a Scare, they put the two cards back at the top of the deck. And you're like, oh, it's Peter's definitely there. So then you don't you don't fate them. You decide not to fate them. But in reality, it's like a hero that's not Peter and like a wish or something like that. And they're like, I'm just trying to scare you into not fating me so that way I don't get actions covered up. But then it's the flip side where if they, because then this is what the player did was, they gimmicked it so like, oh, you should try to fate me now. And then I'm actually willing to try to fate. And then guess what? I pull Peter Pan out of nowhere or I draw something that's a dead draw. So it's like, there are definitely characters in this game that with those types of tactics that can definitely mind game it. And I know Ditto has been wanting to do a show about timing of cards. And recently... I have been learning that a lot when I've been playing a lot of Scar because I think one of the things that really I've learned when playing Scar is that when you want to defeat Mufasa or a core hero, you have to defeat and play Whisper or Long Live the King on the same turn. You cannot do it 
you know, willingly thinking that everything's going to go okay. Because as soon as you get one of those core characters out that you wanted to defeat on the board, someone's going to fate you, and they're going to Hakuna Matata you to death, or play a prophecy or a stick, and then everything just goes to hell. And mm -hmm. yeah, there's, for sure, it was Scar. Oh yeah, it's there's definitely going to be some interesting like plays and moves that I think people are going to learn and see in this tournament with characters and like especially with me playing as much again of like against a Captain Hook recently, like. Strong Captain Hook players, they're going to know how to mitigate and mind game you to the point where your brain just doesn't know what to do. Because I think that's one of the things I personally struggle with with playing against Captain Hook and probably maybe even a lot of other people. I just don't know how to fate the guy. I really don't because you're scared to the whole time. Yeah. I mean, I'm definitely, he, has, he definitely has an interesting mechanic with that. Yeah. They've, they've really done something interesting with that character to the, like, and it's funny because he's a he's a beginning like character probably within the core set, and it's amazing how meta mind gamey that character can really be. For me, he kind of represents the low floor, high ceiling kind of character, where just about anybody can pick Hook up and probably do pretty well, just because he's really straightforward in terms of how you win. But like you were saying, the amount of tricks and mind games and higher level stuff you can get away with once you really understand his deck, uh, he, there's always going to be another way to just trick your opponent into fading Peter Pan into the top spot. Like, you can always set it up for yourself. You just got to know how to do it. Yeah, yeah it's, it's nuts. I'm really looking forward, to the, looking forward to some crazy stuff from these characters. Um... What what is the character that we all actually want to see played at an incredibly high level? I'll tell I, I can tell you what mine is, but I want to hear you you two's uh, opinions. I want to see Scar and I want to see Hades played well. Okay, ditto. Probably Hades. I'd actually really like to see someone bring Radigan into this tournament. Really? Yeah. We're going to see the rat. You know someone's going to... You're going to see some rat. I imagine somebody's going to do it, but probably it's like the secondary just in case if somebody gets banned. Like, this is the fallback character. I got you. I don't know. I'd like to see somebody do him a little bit of justice, because... I'd, like um, I'd like to see some Prince John, just because he's, I think, thought of as such a beginner character. Uh, yeah, some, that's like, what pretty I'm good scared of with like, Prince John. I mean, He's such a straightforward beginner character that he's going to be, you know, just the turtle of the game. Like, let's see if we can guarantee a win with Prince John. So, like, me and my wife, we we started playing this game back in um, around Christmas, right? Okay. We noticed that a couple months in, the game started to shift. And we actually had to sit down and talk about it because it was starting to get to the point where we were not enjoying playing. And we had to realize, like, we're fading so much more because we realize how effective it is. And we both just kind of concluded, okay, we're at that next level of gameplay where we just have to be okay with getting faded, you know, three turns in a row if that's what's going to happen. That's the, yeah. that's the strategy now. That's how, that's how we're going to win. I, I'm not the biggest fan so. of the Fate Wars, but I expect to see a lot of that in the tournament. Yeah. You you expect to see a lot of two or three turns in a row fates? Oh, I expect I it to be the whole match sure. in a lot of situations. Oh no! <laughs> oh no! Especially yeah, I mean, if fates are going to be huge. Like in this, anybody in this decides tournament. to bring Ursula or Cruella or probably Hades or honestly maybe a little bit of Scar too. Like any of these characters that have a bit of a more difficult time with the game. Like I fully expect real fate wars to be going pretty much the entire time do you think that the so like these let's say call weaker characters i don't consider the scar weaker but i we can say like characters like hades and then you know ursula's got the set up to it do you think that the only way their chance of winning is to outfate their opponent because i could see a game of evil queen and um Maleficent, even though it's like that game is all about speed, and Maleficent doesn't necessarily need to even fate Evil Queen that much to try to win. You know, you don't have to fate, and honestly, even with Maleficent, it's actually not a wise decision because both of her fate locations, only one of them really has a benefit towards the goal in some shape or form. 
But I, do you think that certain matchups are going to actually not be a fate war, or do you feel like it's going to be more, it's going to be more dependent on the character's overall strength, and maybe if they're a weaker character like Hades, more fading more is going to be obviously the stronger option to win. What do you folks think on that? Start that with it depends a lot on the player too, because a lot of players are very susceptible to fate wars. I've noticed. Yes. Yes. Um, but if it's a game where there's like two really hyper carry kind of characters, like you said, Maleficent and Evil Queen, or like Facilier and Maleficent, maybe. Yeah, um, I can see that. The too. Fate Wars won't be that bad, but for the most part, if it's Hades, more than likely if it's Ursula, more than likely if it's Cruella, if it's somebody that has to take time to set stuff up, the game will be a Fate War. Yeah, and there's certain, there question. are certain characters that are set up to fate more. Yeah, um, Ur- Ursula is the classic example of I have five different ways to fate you. How would you like to take it today? Yeah. Well, I actually always fall back to Jafar because he he is the he's one of the only characters that has both of his fate squares unlocked while he has a locked space. So that means at minimum every other turn, unless you know there's something has happened or the fate square gets blocked he's gonna fate you right well That's he can right. and he's another one that really kind of needs to because like with the other ones he takes a minute to really get online yep. yeah i um something i noticed when we when we started getting a little bit more in the competitive nature and like the design aspect of the game is that like, if you look at someone like Evil Queen, Captain Hook, and Jafar, the three characters I'm bringing up here. So, like, Evil Queen, she can't fate turn one. She could fate turn two. She can't fate turn one. Captain Hook can fate turn one if he wants to. Might not be the most effective thing, depending on what he has in his hand. And Jafar can do it and always has the ability to fate. Also... Both of those other characters also have the ability to fate as well, regardless if they get blocked or not. But I think there, I think there was some design intent with some of these characters where they did know that these characters with having a lock token need to have. I mean, obviously have to have that fate location open, but the placement of it and like based off your starting hand and like your locations, I think some of these characters are susceptible to actually try to fate every other turn. Because like when I was playing against this Captain Hook recently, Captain Hook is fading every other turn because the Jolly Roger is really not a good spot unless what I noticed too is that like in the early game, if you're trying to discard down and grab the map or try to grab something to fish out pan, you're really chucking cards as much as possible. And since the the three power cost location with hook doesn't necessarily have uh, a discard option, you need to make sure that you can constantly be chucking cards if you're really trying to play that type of game with hook. Which, you know, depending on the player, may or may not do. But it's a it's an interesting thought process to maybe see how heavy the fates are gonna be. Because the worst thing I would want I, I would want to see in this game is where, you know, and we've all been there where you get a hero at every location or two at one location, and then like everything else is covered, and then you're getting brutally destroyed by effect cards, stuff like that. You know, get the Hakuna Matata cycle all over again. And just not be able to do anything about it. But I don't feel like if, especially when you're trying to win with cash on the line and there, there's a speed, there, because there's a time limit involved with these matches, an hour time limit. I do feel that there won't be maybe as much because if you look at all the designs of the realms, there's usually only one realm with a fate spot that is actually like strong towards the goal. The other one is not that strong. It's usually more of a utility location where you're like, I'm playing defense this entire turn. I'm trying to do a, a big old reset on my, my hand. That's why most of those other fate locations have a discard option. Usually um, that type of ordeal. So I'm kind of curious to maybe see how that all yeah. pans out. It, it all comes see down to, point, the... but I th- I'm going to say I disagree with it. Okay. I'm okay with this. Simply, simply because, as you said, there are there is so much money on this, and I don't I look at this as um, kind of like you know the higher level magic tournaments. People are, I feel like, not going into this necessarily to have fun. 
people are going to try and win. Yeah, I expect to see some of that. I don't know. You know, it, this is the it, first it, time we're doing this too, so I'm just. It curious. boils down to the dominant strategy theory. Yeah. Where if there's an easier, more effective way to win a game, you're always going to do it. And what do you yeah, think that dominant? What do you think the dominant strategy is? It's gonna be is? fate worse for the most part. Really? Be, I, I, how I how quickly can that. I shut my opponent down? Hmm. I because uh, I've always thought of this game as a speed game, where really what it boils down to is how fast a character can move towards their goal and how easy it is for them to hinder the speed of their opponent. And do you really feel like that all lies within the fate deck, or do you feel like they're or do you feel like there is a little bit in terms of the deck? Because there obviously is, but do you feel like it teeters a lot more towards the fate deck? I feel like, especially with the time limits that we're putting on it, or that you're putting on it, yeah, the the fate. I mean, because that's all you, you can go fate, and that'd be all you do that turn. And now you've you've dealt your opponent a blow that they have to deal with. They have to figure something out. They're going to have to go out of their way, more than likely, to deal with whatever you just did. So you take your turn super quick, you take, and then it makes their turn where they're going to have to think. They're going to have to redo their strategy, um, whatever that may have been, to deal with this now, you know. Obstacle. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, I think a lot of the speed, when it comes down to cash on the line, win or lose, is going to be less how quickly can I win and more how quickly can I guarantee that they lose. I gotcha. Interesting. I um, because I especially in a game like what I mentioned earlier, where it's like Maleficent and Evil Queen, I don't really expect to be a lot of fading in that. Because even like early game, Evil Queen really shouldn't be going to the laboratory unless she's trying to kill something. Like she's going back and forth between those other two locations to try to like get stuff going there. Because I mean, that's where her her discard spot is. So she absolutely does not have magic tomes at some point. She can discard down and try to grab stuff that she needs. That's where she's getting all her power. If we see an Evil Queen Maleficent, which I'm sure we will, I think Evil Queen is going to have to go out of her way to yep. intentionally fight Maleficent. Absolutely, she's, she's going to have to take those turns and not, you know, maybe perhaps not accomplish her goal as fast as she is wanting to, to deal with how fast Maleficent is if you leave her alone. Interesting. 100%. Yeah. Because huh. I mean, the lucky thing about that is on Evil Queen's part is that it doesn't take a lot for Maleficent's Fate deck to lock her down. Like, you draw King Stefan, boom. Yeah, and it, the thing I've been thinking about with Maleficent recently is that, like, you have those cards like King Stefan where, in theory, when you play him, you could take out two curses in a row. But if the, if the Maleficent player is playing semi-smart, they know those things are coming, and they'll try I mean, to even, set up their board. Even if you can't use Stefan to take out two curses, just using him to displace Ur- or, uh, Ursula. You can see where my brain is. Ursula. <laughs> it's, the same, it's the same thing, though. If you use Stefan to displace Maleficent and put her on a spot maybe she, you know she wanted to move to next turn, you can slow her down a lot just by nature of having her, her rethink, okay, what do I have available to use now? I got you. Oh, yeah, because yeah, cause you're blocking it. Regardless, you're still this blocking options. And yeah. blocking that action, is, it's still para- like paramount, regardless. Just, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, as as um, high level as we're thinking this tournament might get, the Fate Wars are going to be a factor, especially in the later games where you have you know, the probably the more experienced players, the the higher tier players, you know, facing off, and when you've got that much, the amount of money that you know you've put up for this tournament on the yeah. line, I just, I mean, people aren't going to play for fun. People are going to play brutal. They're going to play to win, and to win, you get you've got to slow your opponent down. Uh, you've so, got to you've got to yeah. gain some some form of advantage over them. Huh. This is going to be really interesting. I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing how this all pairs out. You guys have brought some really interesting points. With the, with the fate stuff in mind, I do. So one of the things I did bring up in this conversation is the fact that there is an hour time limit on every single match, and the reason for that is obviously because we're trying to we're trying to get this all wrapped up in one day. Um, I originally was going to make it a little bit smaller, and we're going to run some matches on 
behind the scenes because the plan is to actually stream the tournament uh, so you folks can actually see the craziness going on. We're make, we'll definitely make sure that the finals, losers bra- or, or winner and losers and grand finals, all that will definitely be shown in some shape or form, whether it's on the channel, streamed, whatnot. That is all going to be shown, and plus some other stuff too. But we're going to be running matches back-to-back. You know, I'm already working with people to judge. It's it's going to be a crazy time. But when the time limits, how many do you think we're going to run into any time limits in this tournament, or do you think we're? I don't expect it's definitely it to possible. necessarily be a big deal. Yeah, uh, dealing with a lot of people at this point in that tournament who are pretty familiar with the game and pretty much are going to know what they want to do at least in the outset. So. Right. I, the only time it's really going to start getting into an issue is once the Fate War really starts digging in. Uh, if there's a bunch of really particular, like I'm looking at Ursula and Cruella and Hades especially, and just saying the Fate Wars... The... <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I try to... Yeah, I try to make some... So something else I did too, and for those of you listening, so one of the things I did was in case of a time limit that we is reached... There will be a winner decided based off some accomplishments that the character must make, uh, you know, towards their goal. And I had to take into consideration, especially after the mirror match that Ditto and I played, that there is going to be an Ursula out there that is going to do nothing but grow giant and opportunist the fate nonstop every single turn possible and not achieve their goal in the slightest in any shape or form. It's going to happen. I know it. I feel it in my gut. I feel it in my soul. The magical part is I don't think that game hit an hour. Did it? No, I, uh, well, no, because I basically, I think I honestly could have made it drag out more, but I was just so done with the mirror match because I was just like, I'm in such a stuck position that I just couldn't do anything. That's just impossible. That that right there is why I don't think that hour limit's really going to get hit too often. Just because, uh, like, it, there's going to be a certain limit reached. Oh, with I, I, I could see it happening just because of how people are going to want to take their time and each turn meticulously kind of plan out what they want to do. Make sure they've used all their actions. Make sure they've faded. Make sure they're taking their time to figure out what they're wanting to do. Now, I could be completely wrong, and yep. we could see you know these you know, 15, 20-minute matches just flying by, and that would be it, awesome. It, it could. There could be situations where people want to like really take the time and contemplate every single option, but for the most part, I think we're at the point now where you pretty much know what the best move is going to be, because you have all of your opponents turn to figure out what your next turn is going to be, too, most of the time. Yeah. So it's, so it's not like you're spending 15 minutes exclusively on your turn deciding, oh, if I go there, I'm going to do this, 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 and this. Yeah. Like, um, could, pl- plus yeah. with the mirror match example, like you said, you just got to the point where you didn't care anymore. I think. Yeah. Uh, no. It's that's what. The, if anything, that's going to happen more in the tournament where they just realize, okay, I don't really see a comeback for this. And even if the game looks like it might take a l- little bit over an hour, you know, they'll just give up at that point because there's there's no recovery. <laughs> no, I um, because I I know because I had to rework Ursula's tiebreaker system because. I know for a fact that someone's going to try to do that fate nonsense. And I want to make sure players are actively trying to pursue towards their goals. So, and, and with Ursula, you know, if you're going to keep cycling, grow giant and opportunist and all that nonsense, and you're not actually trying to discard or get rid of stuff to get the trident out or, or the crown and move that stuff around and whatnot, you are just sitting there being a fate monster the entire match and you're not making any progress. And that that's a game that will last two hours not under an hour um so i'm really i'm trying to ignore situations like that and also with the turn stuff too like i put in that it's like two minutes i think is the time limit on a turn that you have the the time to take and like what ditto was saying too like especially like if you watch a lot of videos on the channel like most of the time the longest games that we have at this point that go between two people is usually like 40 minutes like we've gotten to the point where our matches are consistent, most part consistently under thirty. So there, you get a few that go a little bit over, but there's there really isn't any more that go into the fifty minute hour range between two people. There are some very very rare cases where that happens, but most of the time, they're 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 running under thirty minutes. But I can see where it gets into a heavy fate war where they can start 
getting a little crazier with the time. I think it would, I think it would be a little, a little closer, but I do think with a time limit, it's also because you want to guarantee the victory. You don't want to have to worry about counting up points through a tiebreaker. You want to try to be, I am a, a solidified winner at the end of this. There's no thinking twice. I think there will be some of that. Well, and I hate to tie this back up to the other talk about the general fate wars before, but uh, kind of where the idea of these people could just as easily be, how can I make sure you lose? Um, yeah. I honestly think we might start seeing some, you know, 15, 20 minute games where, okay, I've shut you down so much. We both kind of know you've already lost. You might as well just scoop at this point. I don't think we're going to see that. I don't think we're going to see people forfeit in this in this tournament with that much money on the line unless they just get so salty and so tilted. (laughs) I mean, I'm not going to say it hasn't happened before. No, no, it's true. Yeah, I, uh, I've seen I've seen some games in the flesh as well as on the internet. Luckily, that none of them have been recorded, minus me flipping a table on Ursula and and play a game. But um, and uh, if you've seen some of the bigger cash tournaments and other games too, like people will forfeit over just being locked down to the point where they can't do anything. So I don't know oh. how, com- how common it's going to be, but. I expect to see a couple games in that way. Yeah. Well, we'll we'll have to we'll have to see. I'm curious. This is the first time anything like this has ever been being done at all. So this will actually be a really interesting experience from like a tournament holder perspective because I've never done something like this before. I'm literally using the stuff that I know from like Evo and fighting game tournaments and the and the little knowledge I know of how Magic the Gathering tournaments operate as well as other like tabletop tournaments in general. Um, so it'll be interesting kind of like to see, you know, how players feel at the end of it. And I definitely want feedback from those who take place in the tournament. So stop, man, I'm looking at you. Yell at me if I do something wrong. Um, yeah, I'll, be, oh, I'll be yelling. I'll be yelling. <laughs> oh, my, my judge card and getting everybody over. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, it'll, be, it'll be interesting for sure. Um, and I'm also excited because uh, Ditto and I are going to probably commentate most of these matches. That'll be a fun time. I don't know about most of them, but I'll probably be there for one or two. Yeah, well, we'll have we'll have to see how many we end up having to put on the the board because I plan on having you. I know Wero told me he's going to try to help me. Stuntman, whatever matches you aren't going to be in, I'll probably have you join, um, and as well, and I'll probably have a few other folks who would like to join. Um, it'll be it'll be fun to uh, it'll it'll be fun to commentate and actually like because one of the oh, things I've been telling. Well. Because like I've been telling people like recently, I've actually like spectated a few games on Tabletop Simulator, and it's actually been incredibly fun to actually just like watch people play this. Game. Now, the- like, theory crafting this game is beautiful. It is it is oh, yeah. absurdly that, good. That's gonna be really fun just to just to watch and see and like I said, see all these crazy plays like you're not expecting. Like why did they do that? And then you know, two turns later, it's like oh I see, like I see. Yeah. No, I it's it's gonna be awesome, and I cannot wait. That is the, the it'll be coolest good. thing. All gonna be real good. Yeah. You know, I guess I want to. The last thing I want to bring up on the show is that stuntman, you are here. You are participating in the tournament. How do you feel? You have any advice to give people preparing the tournament? I know you come from a Magic the Gathering background, so I don't know. I don't know what you what you're doing to prepare yourself and all that stuff. I'm excited. To see how you uh, operate. Yeah, I'm super excited. I'm nervous a little bit just because I don't know. I mean, there is a lot of money riding on it, so I, I, it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting. Um, as far as advice goes, I would say everyone picks Scar, Hades, and Cruella <laughs> your three villains. Um, <laughs> oh no. Um, I mean, just you know, learn know know the rules before you go into it, and know what you're doing, and take time and read over the tournament document. Um, yes. It's going to be, that's going to be huge. It's going to be where all the questions are going to be answered and mm-hmm. don't be afraid to ask a question during the middle of a match. Um, if, right. if you don't understand the mechanic of a card or there's some weird situation, like reach out to that judge that's watching you or one of the commentators or whatever. Yeah. We, we, we yeah. Who are knowledgeable enough to, to be able to figure out those simple situations pretty quickly. 
Yeah, we, I am, um, so I have a lot of people that are going to be helping judge these matches and something that is going to be happening over the coming weeks is that I'm going to be talking to all the judges about kind of the etiquette and like what to do during the matches, you know, because I mean, we're going to, we're going to have some judgment call stuff where like if someone plays a card wrong, then obviously that can't be played like that, but it'll be stuff like if you do not understand maybe what to do in this particular situation with the card, judge will be there. They'll be nice about it. Um, I do recommend obviously read the tournament document, all of the rules and stuff for how the tournament is going to operate, what the prize pool is, the achievements for all the characters, yeah, and you know how you know etiquette during a match, you know all that stuff's going to be there, including the tiebreaker rules for all the villains. So you know, like if we do get to that point where a tiebreaker happens, like what are we looking for? And also the FAQ document that we as like the community and some of the designers from Prospero have chipped in on with their two cents on how stuff's supposed to work. Like look at that document, understand all those weird mechanical things that like when you get into the deep heady meta game of this game, everyone has to understand. And even I screw things up sometimes too, but I mean, that's what that document's there for. So that way everyone has access to it. Even if you're not participating in the tournament to like know how a rule is supposed to go out. And definitely, I'll tell you up front, as someone who plays a load of Scar, know your decks. Like, know them backwards and forwards. Know your Fate deck. Know how they operate. Just yep. just know it. Like, And, and along with that, uh, know the know your matchups really well, too. Like, oh, yeah. If you expect a particular character to be a problem for you, study up on them. Make sure you know what to look for. That way you know when the right time to try to play aggressive is going to be. Yeah, I am. Um... I, I've been playing a few people that I know are going to be participating in the tournament, and they've been, we've been practicing a little bit on um, together, so that way we can get all that stuff like situated away. They kind of know what the weird scenarios could be in those particular situations, and, and knowing, the matchup knowledge knowing your good. opponent's deck and being okay with calling them on a wrong move. I think is another thing just to not be afraid of doing. If you don't think they're playing their card correctly or they have done something, they've moved wrong or whatever it is, you know, just bring it up and say, Hey, is that how that works? Like, can you, can you explain to me what you did just now or why, why, you know, what are you, what are you doing looking through your, you know, your deck? Why are you doing that? Oh yeah. Cause like some of that stuff too is like, and that's something that in the FAQ document it talks about that we put in is like, you know, when someone plays like a scrying card, does it say reveal or look? Because if it's looking, you technically can't ask what they're looking at, you know, but revealing, you need to make sure that you know what's being revealed. So that way, like, oh, those cards are gone from their deck. I need to be aware of what's probably coming or what they might be grabbing here in the future, because then I have to start prepping my game to either fate or move faster than they are. And that's just like, and some of this also comes down to just, you know, and I put this in the tournament document when it comes to the rules, but be a decent human being. Don't be a jerk. Etiquette is wonderful. You know, just be nice. You know, that's, I mean, I, one of the things I proud, I pride, or I pride myself in this community that we've grown is that we are relatively really nice people. Like we don't really have situations that pop up. No, we're we're all like communing over Disney. I don't think pettiness is really going to be that big. We all love this game and we want more people to join us. So no one be a jerk. Yeah. No one, no one be a jerk. Yeah, just don't be – rule number one, don't be a jerk. That's a story I have to tell at some point. Maybe I'll tell that on the on the, the live show at some point. But, uh, but yeah, don't be a jerk. Be nice to each other. Um, and even when we, like, when we get into disagreements, it's usually us, like, we're disagreeing because we're trying to figure out what the rule is supposed to be. That's usually the largest disagreement that we go into and, on, in terms of the channel. But it's never, like, anything aggressive or argumentative. It's just us trying to – resolve something so we can actually play the game correctly you know that's the most we get into and i really yeah and I, anyone I, that anyone that hasn't already join the discord y'all like we this is a great community and we want more people to talk to yeah seriously i i've been actually really happy with the fact that we've been getting a lot of new faces recently, and it's been a it's been a joy so please join us especially with all this tournament stuff coming up you're going to get all the announcements and all that stuff on so but yeah i think that wraps it up. And, and believe it or not, folks, there were so many technical difficulties in this show. I don't know how we were able to finish it. I really don't. No kidding. Yeah, no kidding. I had, a, I had the internet drop on me. Spectrum right now is being a jerk to me. I'm recording this on my phone. It's fantastic. 
Um, but there we go, friends. Uh, thanks, Ditto. Thanks, Stuntman, for joining me on this awesome show. I cannot wait for this tournament. I'm really looking forward to it. Yes, me um, too. As always, thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Oh, absolutely. You, you're you always a blast guest on the show. And uh, hopefully when we, you know, once this tournament wraps up and we we get a better idea how to run a tournament and we'll probably run one more this year, depending on if we hear another Disney tournament and also how compatible Marvel is, because you absolutely all know, you all know me that there's going to be some Marvel baby at a tournament and I'm going to be making Marvel versus Capcom 2 references the whole time. And like, no one's going to understand what I'm talking about, except for all you dark, hardcore diehard Marvel versus Capcom fans. Um, yeah, we probably don't have much longer to wait on news for that one. No, I cannot wait. I cannot wait. I want to know. I want to know how compatible it is. I want to know so bad. And then hopefully at one point we'll get Magneto. We can get Magneto and then I can start making Magneto references for NBC too. But uh, thank you two for joining me. Thank you so much for everyone who is listening to the show. And until next time, I hope you all stay wicked.